Hello? Huh? Yes, is this Ni Nicholas Veronico? Speaking. This this is Nicholas Veronico. Yes, who's this? How you doing, uh, Mr. Veronico? My name is Robert Bassano. I'm a graduate student. Um, I'm uh, studying artificial intelligence at Stanford. Um, I was wondering if you personally could be able to provide me with a little bit more detail on the Sophia platform, or if you could recommend someone I could speak to. Um, I'm working on an application that would allow for a machine learning program to pick up and identify specific objects using um, high performance optical telescopes. You, the, my instant thought is that there's a problem there because we see in the infrared. You see in the infrared? Yeah, so Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Okay. So it's not, we don't, we don't see things like an optical telescope. We have to find like stars near our infrared source and we focus the telescope on a black spot in space. Okay. And then we get the infrared radiation through our instruments. So, uh, so Sophia only, so Sophia views everything in the sky on an infrared scale on wavelength, right? That's, that's where we do our research. We do our optical guiding through what you and I see. Okay. So let's just say, you know, whatever I'm seeing up in the sky, if I can see it with ground-based telescope, you would be able to see that, that same object in infrared. Yeah. Okay. So now how... You see things you can't see it with an optical telescope. Okay. Now how does that compare to HST? Is, is is Sophia linked? Is Sophia linked with HST? No, they're they see out to about five microns in the infrared. Okay. And we go uh, out to two hundred and fifty to three hundred microns right now. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wait. Are you serious? So wait, wait, you're saying Sophia, which flies at around thirty-five, forty-five thousand feet, can see nearly a hundred. And 50 times further than Hubble? In the infrared? Yes. Yes. Wow, Nick. Wow. How is that? Yeah. Huh? Awesome. How is that possible? Because we, we're two different. We're two different. We're apples and oranges. That's how. Apples and oranges. So, so I, you know, I like oranges. You know, it's good in vitamin C. So, <laughs> which one? <laughs> how big would be your orange and how big would be the apple? <laughs> So, uh, actually, our both of our telescope mirrors are about the same size. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. It, yeah, I, I, and I absolutely didn't. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, that's it's just it's the 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 instruments they use are different than what we use, and that's really the only difference. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to determine because I looked at I conducted a comparison of the technical specs of of HST and the technical specs of Sophia. So, and I know that the SOFIA program, well, not the SOFIA program per se, but the Stratosphere Observatory platform is older than HST. Um, you guys have just been doing it on different aerial platforms, and it just grew to a 747. That's what I've been doing the history on. But I, I noticed that the, that the technical specs are almost similar. But I'm trying to wrap my head around how is it possible you have HST, which is supposed to be 330 miles plus, you know, beyond the exosphere. And you've got Sophia, which is in the stratosphere. You guys are looking far beyond. You're looking through another few couple of layers and looking way past HST. And you're able to capture things on a much more, how, would it be fair to say, a high definition type of quality in infrared? Um, I don't know about that, but the thing, so NASA has HST, they have SOFIA and infrared. Okay. They have what Chandra and X-ray, they have all different, uh, observatories to cover all of the, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. And 
if we all look at the same thing, the same object, you're going to learn something different depending on, you know, what uh, wavelength you're looking at it. Okay. So that's why they, that's why we have all these different telescopes is, uh, you know, we can do things that others can't do and, you know, they can see things that we can't see. So uh, it's a good marriage. Now, now, is, has, has there been occasions where, where Sophia and HST, HST are taking the same exact photo of the same exact object on the same day? No. 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 But, no. What happens is we put out a call for proposals. As a matter of fact, there's one open right now. Okay. And we take all those proposals, and they decide what is the best use of Sophia. Okay. And then they award time to those proposals, and we go out and let's say you got eight hours of observing time from you know some star forming region. Okay. You you might get three hours on one flight, an hour and a half on another, two hours on one, and you know. How how, how many flight. platforms are there for Sophia? Is there just one plat one aircraft? One aircraft, but we have uh, seven eight different instruments. Okay. And but we only fly one instrument at a time. It takes about two days to change it. Now, it, there's a. Uh, is Sophia still based in New Zealand, or is it, or is it in the U.S.? It's it's out of Palmdale is where the airplane resides, but the scientists are all in Mountain View. Okay. And we're having a uh, a science seminar, a conference in. Uh, down by Santa Cruz at the Asilomar Conference Center in October. Okay. And that's something you might want to go to. Asilomar. And I, yeah. And let me see if I can uh, let me get my computer started and I'll. Uh... Yeah, because, and, and, and you know, something else that's interesting because I, here's the thing. I had been looking at some of the images from Sophia and, and HST. And I know this may sound weird, Nick. But I found a photo, a comparative photo from a ground observatory, Sophia and HST of the M82 supernova. The photo was taken around January 22nd of 2014. Now, hold your, your oranges and apples for this one. They were taken on the same day. That, yes. As a matter of fact, I think I was on Sophia for that picture. You're kidding. You were on Sophia when that picture was taken? Yep. So you, you were on, on board when, when the infrared was taken of the M82 supernova on January 22nd, 2014? Yeah. I believe oh, man. Did I get lucky with you? Did I get lucky with you? Man, thank you so much for verifying that. Is there any way you could actually email me? The I mean, because you know I get the information online at you guys' site, but a lot of the information is just scattered all over the place because I'm not even sure if the photos for Sophia online on NASA are up to date. Because I'm getting very limited from HST team. I spoke to the people at HST, and he, you want to hear something interesting? Have you ever seen Have you ever seen HST in, in, in real time in operation? No. You've never seen it. How How long were you, how, how long have you been with the Sophia team? Eight years. Eight years. Well, here's the thing. You know, Director Bolden was the the mission commander for HST when it launched. Well, right. you know, and they had the servicing missions. So I had a I had a talk with one of the deputy program managers, and you know he had been working for working on the HST team for twenty five years, and you know I was I was are you familiar with the FAI database Federation Aeronautic International? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know that vast majority of all of the uh, STS missions on that database, including Apollo and all the Russian launches and other countries, um, including Phyllis Baumgartner's records on there. So I went searching for, because I needed to know um, at what altitude 
did the um, STS-31 got to, to basically deploy HST. And I saw a recent video on JPL, it's on their website, where they show the 2002 servicing mission. And it dawned on me that STS in 2002 was on top of HST. Now, <laughs> I thought that that was actually a weird photo because it shows it shows the Earth in, on the bottom, of course, and then it shows it shows the STS shuttle on top of HST servicing it, getting ready to deploy it. And then when I asked the question of HST team members, I said, "Wait a minute! When I put in, you know, the flight date for HST in 1990, it's not there." And the response, you know, was what I expected. You know, NASA doesn't manage the FAI database. But when you start, when you put in the servicing missions, the servicing, most of the servicing missions are there, but two of the servicing missions are not listed. Well, here's the kicker. HST launch April 24th, 1990. If you put in that flight number, the year, all of the crew member name for that flight, it's not in the database. So I asked HST, is there a reason why someone didn't submit the application or the documentation, the FAI for this? He says, I don't know. We don't manage that database. I said, that's understandable. And I said, but how is it that some of the servicing missions that are there, but the main mission to put HST at 330 miles is not there. That was supposed to be the greatest mass lifted to the greatest altitude. You know, and I, I put in all the variables. I contacted AFI. They said that there was no problems with their database. They even looked back in their records. It took them about, you know, a month and a half. They, and they said, well, you know, we don't even have an application or any documentation that was filed for that mission. He goes, you might want to you might want to call back to NASA and ask them. So, you know, of course, I call NASA to ask them. And, you know, you figure in 25 years, somebody who's responsible for doing this, which they don't know who's responsible for doing it. They all said, hmm, that's interesting, just like you just did. Hmm, that's interesting. So I asked the deputy project manager, is it possible? Have you ever seen HST? He says, no, I've only seen it on the servicing missions. I said, okay, you've seen the servicing missions. I said, but nobody's ever set eyes on it. He goes, no, we don't have optical tracking. I said, okay. I said, are you familiar with Sophia? He says, yes, yeah, somewhat. So when I told him what the capabilities of what Sophia was versus Hubble, he says, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong. Sophia can't do infrared and wavelength like Hubble. I said, that's not true. I'm on Sophia's website right now. <laughs> and it says it in the OIG, in Office Inspector General Report, what Sophia is capable of doing in wavelengths. And I I tried to share the document. He says, well, you know, they, they must have a new capability. I said, is that possible? Because the telescopes are almost identical. <laughs> almost identical. As a matter of fact, Sophia at 45,000 feet can see things much further than HST in infrared. How is that possible? And he didn't know. So that's why I had to call you. <laughs> because I wanted to be clear that you know, because sometimes, you know, when media information is put out and technical information, it, it might get mixed up with something else. And if I'm going to be drafting a research paper on this, using artificial intelligence based on images you guys already taken so that, so that the, 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 the API for this machine learning program will be able to discern what you looked at before to look for any other sort of anomalies, I need, that paper needs to be spot on because... I want to publish it and I can't publish something that's technically inaccurate and then I get laughed at you know what I mean yeah. so I just thought that that was strange that Hubble is not even showing in an international database at all so I'm, I'm I've come to the logical conclusion that Sophia has, has been our platform for all, you know, optical science research. So, 
just my own recollection is that Hubble C is out to about 2.5 microns. Hubble C is 2.5 microns. Okay, got that. To the, yeah, and to the infrared. To the infrared, and, okay. Yeah, and then our suite of instruments, I'm going to send you a, uh, a PDF on this. Okay. Um, you know, we're started, we're starting at uh, one micron out to 237, which is with some other uh, limiting factors, we're about to 250. So Sophia can see at, how, what, what's the capability of Sophia? Uh, out to about 250 microns. 250 microns. Now that's based on what altitude? Uh, we can go up to 45,000 feet. Okay, so 250 microns you can see flying at 200, I mean 45,000 feet in the infrared. Okay. Yeah. Now, can, can anyone pay for time with Sophia? No. No, you have to propose. Oh, so it's submit a proposal, I can put it through the university, and then based on, you know, what the proposal entails, then it gets, out, time gets allocated. Yeah, and I'm going to send you the link for our uh, observer's handbook for this next cycle, too. Okay. So in case you want to propose. Yeah. That's incredible. And I'm sending you the Supernova 2014J. Okay. Okay. And then uh, what's your email? Yeah, send it to R, as in Robert, M, as in Mike, Bassano, B A S S A N O, at Gmail. I'll just store that in my Google Drive. Yeah, there's some, some people you should, uh, you know, talk to. But I think you need to look at some of this stuff a little more. What's, what stuff? Uh, just some of the links I'm going to send you. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, but it's just it's just strange because, um, you know... I, I was trying to get more data on HST and there's nothing. It just stopped all of a sudden. And and it stopped well before 2002. It just stopped. What, what uh, where are you at at Stanford? Um, I'm, I'm doing their graduate uh, certificate in AI. Okay. And then I'm gonna move on to uh, machine learning and um, robotics. Nice. Okay, well, let me get this uh, email over to you. Yeah, I, I developed an algorithm about 10 years ago that was shared with JPL, and it caught their interest because um, it 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 allowed for it allowed for the reconfiguration of a test and test and measurement device to pick up ultra low frequency ultra high energy signal transmission hmm. and the first thing they said was who are you and where did you get this from because <laughs> I guess it helped them locate something that they had trouble communicating with and yeah, it, it, it's a multi-use algorithm that I developed I, I didn't at the time when I was working on it, it was for something else specific and then I modified it, shared it with professors, at two professors in theoretical physics and applied mathematics at MIT. They said it was beyond them. And then two months later, I get an email back from one of them in a handwritten note. It says, Robert, this may be of interest to you, and it involves black body radiation. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know what that was at the time. And I called them up and I said, black body, what? Why did you send me Max Planck's? constant in an equation he goes you want to start researching this I say well can you help me he goes no because what you developed in an algorithm is beyond me but I think this may be the missing piece so I I've been researching black body radiation and lo and behold when I started to 
you know, tootle around with my algorithm and some other mathematics using Planck's constant, it literally opened the door for me to start doing the research on artificial intelligence with regard to image image analysis processing and identification of um, specific type of bodies that are emitting a certain type of light and if, if you're familiar with black body ratio which I'm still getting familiar with it myself I've been watching a bunch of videos on it and it let's just put it this way it's really fascinating I started putting together and fusing dark matter dark fluid with super helium 4 and potentially um, now someone's introduced me to what sulfur hexafluoride can do and when you combine the both it, something very interesting occurs and I think I know why we can't see things on a specific spectrum using say the Sophia platform or Hubble what I'm saying is this is there's a possibility I might have created the capability for you to see something that you're looking for that may be right in your line of view but no one knows how to put together the calculations of mathematics and I'm not saying you guys don't I'm just saying that there's a possibility and I of course I can't do it from the, from the ground but it would require looking at the same object you might have been looking at and seeing a lot more of what may be comprising the vision of that object. You may see the other ingredients. So, I, but again, it's just something that I'm, I'm working on and developing, but I need clarity because obviously can't use HST. It might not even be there. <laughs> it might not even be there. I don't understand why it's not in the FAI database. You know, the guy I talked to, he's been there for 25 years. He was not familiar with it at all. And when I told him about it, he says, well, I don't know. We don't manage that database. But no one, no, no one's ever, he said that no one on the team has ever seen HST, ever seen it. They've never seen it in real time. And I, my, my explanation to him was this, I've been in the military, you know, and when you set out an ROV or a drone, you have a camera on it. You know what it's doing. You know if something comes in contact with it so you can avoid whatever. And, you know, that's, of course, for, you know, Earth-based type of remote vehicles and drones and automated systems. But if you're going to put a $1.5 billion, 43-and-a-half-foot tall telescope out beyond the exosphere, you'd like to know if something ever tried to come in contact with it. I mean, just every now and then, you'd like to flip the camera on and say, well, let's see what it looks like. Because if some, yeah, you have telemetry data and signals intelligence that tells you if the thing is healthy and if it's functioning properly. But when it does go down and you can't, you can't troubleshoot it from the ground, right? You have to get a visual because maybe something might have hit the thing. And here's the interesting thing. I found out ISS can't even take a picture of HST. Now, is that not weird to you? Because they have at least, what, a half a dozen, dozen cameras on the ISS. Is it, is it because they don't come close enough? Or no, no, no. Here's the thing. ISS can raise and ISS loses and gains in altitude with every orbit, somewhere around a mile to two miles. I, I can show you this video online where ISS dropped from 223 miles down to 190 miles, okay? They took a LIDAR photo 1,100 miles off the coast of Antarctica. It looked like it was taken from Sofia. It looked like it was taken from Sofia. So I thought that that was strange because the person who took the photo, they, they did a TED conference. All right, Don Pettit, and he says that they got down, and then they jumped back up to 240 miles. Now, here's the interesting thing. I asked the deputy program manager, I said, wait a minute, HST, the, you said the last service you mentioned was around 2008, 2009. Those missions are not even in the record books. So I, 
I didn't want to focus on that. I just said, basically, this is what I'm trying to come down to. I'm very familiar with orbital mechanics, atmospheric drag, okay? HST is, there's less atmosphere where it's supposed to be. But if it takes an orbit every 95 minutes at 17,000 miles an hour, okay? And we're looking at at least what? Let's say the last service image was 2008. You're looking at eight years. If you go from that eight year time span from when supposedly the STS was to push the eight, the Hubble back up into its 330 plus mile orbit, geosync orbit. From that moment, every 95 minutes, HST should be losing about a mile to two miles of altitude every single 95 minutes. How do I know this? Is because that's exactly what ISS does. And ISS is five to six times larger than HST. ISS is a hundred is a hundred yards long, fifty yards wide. So of course, the larger something is, the greater its mass, the the more altitude it's going to lose. But ISS has propulsion systems to push it back up into low Earth orbit. Correct? Guess what? Yeah. HST has no type of propulsion system to maneuver it at all. It can only change direction meaning it can only swivel around because it's got some internal gyros that allow it to flip in in you know a forward or backward direction or turn sideways to look at a particular area of the sky so it's lose it has been losing altitude for the past eight years so if you do the mathematics iss is at 240 245 hubble is supposed to be 330, 340, 340. So they're about 100 miles away from each other. Now, when the sunlight supposedly hits HST, ISS crew should be able to see HST and zoom in on it with a 600 millimeter, 800 millimeter telephoto lens. There's never been a single photo of HST. Now, when you look at the eight year time frame, to this very moment right now, if you were to track Hubble and ISS based on the orbitable decay, okay, Hubble should be somewhere, if I did my math, but I didn't want to exaggerate, but if you want to hear my exaggerated math, the Hubble should be 10,950 feet in the Marianas Trench, <laughs> but that's exaggerating. But if you want to be more reasonable and say, okay, it's maybe it's not decaying a mile or two miles. Even if you're conservative, Hubble should be within 10 to 20 miles line of sight of ISS. All you have to do is do the math. And when I said this to this individual, he says, uh, I don't know where the ISS is. So I pulled up the ESA international website that tracks ISS. I told him where it was. It was on 250 seven miles at the time and then I went on a website to track HS, HST and the data is false. The data is false because one it's an online API software program and it's very easy to program in a, a different altitude. Whatever it is they're saying that's up there it's not HST because mathematically it shouldn't be there. If it's decaying and it's supposed to be dropping in altitude. And, and get this, factually, scientifically speaking, when you look at the laws of aerodynamics and astronautics, there's no way an STS could have gotten beyond ISS to service HST. They just don't, they didn't have the fuel, they didn't have the capability to get up to that altitude and maintain velocity. Because you have to be. 240 miles high at the time. Well, well, here's the thing. That if that were true, that means that HST did drop down to about 200, around the same altitude of ISS. That's the only way the STS could have gotten to HST and captured it and then pushed it back up to orbit. But even if they did push it back up to orbit, there's no way you could have created that much force and energy 
to catapult it another hundred miles beyond ISS. There's no way. I mean, I know the laws of physics. I understand. I, I learned them just as everyone else learns them. An object in motion stays in motion until something gets in its way to change its, its velocity, vector, and direction. But if you pushed HST up back into its orbit, that means it would have kept going. That just makes logical, scientific, basic high school physics sense. If you captured HST on its last surface and had to push it back into orbit, and it has no propulsion system to stop it from going any further, that means they lost it. And that's my scientific conclusion, that they, when they went up there for the second servicing mission and they tried to catapult it and it had nothing to stop it from continuing on beyond its projected orbital plane and, 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 and motion, that means it just kept going and they lost it. Yeah. It had to. I mean, Nick, <laughs> you... I don't know what your, your detailed background is, but, you know, if you're the Sophia Science, you're handling Sophia Science information, you and I both know, you know, a high school kid could put together a math and say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This thing doesn't have anything to stop it. There are no jets on it or nothing. And if they pushed it back out there, six missions, it, it's not there. It's just not there. And I can understand the embarrassment of someone admitting to that. I'd be embarrassed too if I lost a billion and a half dollar piece of technical equipment. <laughs> but why not just say, oh my God, we lost it. And we're going to create the James Webb telescope. And that's why we're taking our time to make sure that we can make sure it's done right. Because that's what's supposed to replace the Hubble. Am I correct? Yeah. The James Webb is supposed to replace Hubble. I think that the reason why it's been taking so long for James Webb is because they need to have a vehicle they can control and keep stable. I don't understand why Hubble was designed the way it was designed because, you know, when, when they said that an aberration was in that mirror and I read the OIG report and I found out about Sophia, the first thing I thought was, holy mackerel, they, they somehow captured Hubble brought it back down, dismantled it, and handed it off to Sophia. Because <laughs> that's what I thought. I thought that they gutted it and basically put it into a 747 and, and, and put it on steroids so it could have a 250 micron IR capability. That's my thought. No, no, I know, I know, I know. But that, that was my theory on it, but I don't know HSST. I don't know. I don't know how you sit at sit at a, a a control console for twenty five years and you never see what it is you're supposed to be monitoring. You just don't do that. You just you just don't. I mean, NASA's part of a defense agency. You don't send those type of expensive pieces of technology out into space without having eyes on, or at least having something out there that can monitor Hubble from a distance and see it. They said that there's no other vehicle asset in GeoSync that could ever come within distance of HST just to take a picture of it. Well, we took pictures of the shuttle in mid-flight. I don't see why we could... Oh, yeah, you take pictures of the shuttle in mid-flight, of course. But why not HST? And then when I saw the photos of HST being serviced, nobody ever asked. well, that, that, and that's interesting. But when I saw the, the some of the servicing missions where the HST was the ST the shuttle is on top of HST and they're looking down at the Earth, I'm like, that's impossible. There's no way you maneuvered yourself on top of this thing. There's no way unless it was in lower altitude. If it was in lower altitude, that the answer I, I provided my own answer. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I would look forward. Now, with this conference you're talking about, are you going to let um, students and maybe civilians maybe take a ride on Sophia? Uh, no, you could go yourself and maybe, uh, you know, your, if you had a postdoc. Okay, perfect. 
Perfect. That'd be outstanding. Nicholas Veronico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Take care, sir. You have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye.